this morning, guys. You know, we started our series last week. Our two, uh, you know, it was a two-part series, but it's going to be a three-part series. Amen. We'll start our part three after Liz and I get back for our honeymoon, and I'm sure I'll have some new insights about life. Amen. In general, and the angels and their grace. Um, but last week, we went over what? Demons, right? Now, our title was A World of Demons. This morning's title is The City of Angels. Amen? The City of Angels. Last week, we went over 10 fast facts about demons, and I encourage you, you don't have to write them all down. You can watch the video later and, and you know, pause and play, pause and play, pause and play in order so that you can get all these facts down. But I would encourage you to listen. Turn first to Revelation chapter 12. This is the passage we opened up with last week. And we will open up to this passage as well, but I'm going to give you 10 fast facts about angels. Amen? So 10 fast facts. Number one, the Hebrew word for angel is malak. The Greek word is angelios. Both mean messenger. They deliver, the, yes, the messages of the word of God, but also the messages of judgment to man. Number two. In the Old Testament, angel shows up 108 times. In the New Testament, 186 times. That's a total of 294 times. That's pretty intense. 294 times. The word angel shows up in 34 books out of the 66 books from Genesis to Revelation. Bottom line, the word angel shows up more times in the word of God than the word disciple. But how much study have we put into... The angels of God. Number three, angels are created beings and they do not propagate. Psalm 148 verses 2 through 5 talk about how the heavens and the angels were created and they are even called the sons of God. Number four, they are spirits. Most, For the most part, they are invisible. Hebrews 1, 5 through 7 references angels to the wind or to flames. So Hebrews 1, 5 through 7 explains and references angels to equivalents to the wind or to flames. Is that awesome? Verse 14 of Hebrews chapter 1 says that all angels are ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. So literally, angels are the messengers on the earth that are sent by God to encourage and serve those who will inherit salvation. Isn't that amazing right there? Now, according to this as well, they are referenced to as flames and the wind, but by the command of God to do the will of God, they can take on the appearance of a man. Number five, they are genderless and have no marriage. You can reference Matthew 22, verse 30, that they are genderless and have no marriage. However, in the scriptures, in every instance, they are in the masculine appearance. Every time you see angels in the scriptures, there is a masculine appearance to them. So... Although in, uh, when perceived, basically, how they're perceived in the scriptures, they're basically like superhero warriors. Amen? They're these, they're these big dogs. They're these Goliaths. They're, they're these big homies, if you, want, if you will. The only slight exception in the Bible to non, a non-masculine appearance is in Zechariah 5.9, when Zechariah has a vision of two women with wings. But again, that's just a vision. They weren't actually an angel. Amen? So a little tip for you guys. On Valentine's Day... For all the brothers, don't say to your wives or your girlfriends, babe, you look like an angel. Are you with me right here? But for you sisters, a little bit of a tip. It, you'd go a long way to say, honey, you look like the angel of the Lord. Amen? <laughs> Just be mindful of that. Uh, number six, angels are powerful. One angel in one night killed 185,000 men of the Assyrian army, the enemies of God, in Isaiah chapter 37, verse 36. They are incredibly powerful. Number seven, how many angels are there? Revelation 5.11 says there's 10,000 times 10,000. There's only a few. Just kidding. Psalm 34.7, get this, says an angel of the Lord will encamp around those who fear God. There's so many angels, there's 10,000 times 10,000, that there's so many angels that God will literally discharge the duty of his, of his ministry right there. And send and say, listen, you got to encamp around anyone on earth that fears the Lord, that fears God, has an angel encamped around them. Saved or not saved, righteous or unrighteous, if they fear God, they got an angel encamped around them. Number eight, we only know the names of three angels. 
according to the scriptures. We only know the names of three angels. Michael, Gabriel, and Satan. In Jude 9, Michael, in Jude 9, Jude verse 9, there's only one chapter. Jude verse 9 says that Michael was the archangel. Now, most of Christendom holds that there, because these are, only, these are the only three named angels, these are the three archangels. Amen? But Jewish tradition holds that there are four. Number nine, you're going to like this one. They are independent thinking, and they have a big heart. After all, they rejoice over every sinner who returns to the Lord. Amen? It says that when we leave the 99 and go after the one, there are angels rejoicing in heaven. You see, when you're holy, you're happy. The byproduct of that is that you're happy. The angels are holy, and the angels are happy. Amen? Number 10, there's only one angel that has a last name, and this is an angel that is holy and happy because this angel's last name is Alvarado, and on July 4th, he started dating Cynthia Ruiz, amen? That's our very own angel, amen? I just threw that one in for fun. Let's get to our study in Revelation chapter 12, starting in verse 7. Are you guys excited to hear about the city of angels? Revelation chapter 12, starting in verse 7, it says, There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, the ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled down to the earth, and his angels with him. Wow. The Bible makes it very clear that there was a war in heaven, that Satan and his angels were hurled down to the earth. And of course, we know that the angels of Satan are fallen angels. Amen. Now go over here to chapter, and continue in the chapter of 12, and go to verse 17. It says that the dragon, which is also another name for Satan, was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Right here it says that the dragon, Satan, is enraged at the woman. Now the woman right here is the Jewish nation. And it's making war. He's going to make war against the Jewish nation. But it says, make war against the rest of her offspring. Now, right here, her offspring is the disciples of Jesus Christ. It's the Christians of today. So right here, Satan and his angels are at war with those who obey the commandments of God and to hold to the testimony of Jesus. Not just believe the commandments, not just teach the commandments, not just read them, but obey them and hold to the testimony of Jesus, not just know the testimony of Jesus. Satan and his angels are at war against us, the city of angels, this morning. Amen? That is us as disciples. Now let's go over here to Acts chapter 8, and we'll pick up in our first point. So we need to know that there is a spiritual warfare out here. Acts chapter 8, we're going to figure out what are the angels' influence in the Bible. Acts chapter 8. Point number one, we serve angels, we have angels of salvation. Point number one, we're going to study about angels, angels of salvation. Our subpoint is disciples of action. Angels of salvation and disciples of action. Pick it up here in Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 26. It says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Wow, so an angel has a say, has a push in disciples' lives. Isn't that amazing? They have something to do and an influence with salvation. It says in verse 27, so he started out. You see, an angel was of salvation, and the disciples were of action right there. He started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Now notice, it says in verse 26, the angel of the Lord said to Philip, In verse 29, it says, the spirit of the Lord said to Philip. So both the angels and the Holy Spirit have everything to do with salvation. Isn't that awesome? So if you are fearful of the Lord, you have angels encamped in a fellowship around you. If you're a disciple of Jesus Christ and you've been baptized, Acts chapter 2, you have the spirit within you. So you literally have a voice inside of you and voices around you constantly pushing you and driving you to share your faith. 
So when we, we need to comprehend this, that whenever you feel a nudge to talk to someone, all disciples will know what I'm talking about. Whenever you have a nudge to talk to somebody and you feel like, man, I got to share my faith with that person. Oh my gosh, that person needs Jesus. Oh my gosh, that person's a sinner. You have a person on your, you have a person on your heart. You're like, man, I got to hit up that person from high school. That could be an angel of the Lord right there pushing you and compelling you. No, it's not your guilty conscience. It's an angel of the Lord. It's the spirit of the Lord. And for us, the only thing that Philip had to do was obey the voices he heard and the voices within him. And in verse 30, it says, Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet and asked him, do you understand what you're reading? So he completely obeys. When the angels are of salvation, they do not preach, but they put you in position to preach. Does that make sense? The angels do not preach. It's not the angels in the Old Testament that preach to the crowds. No, they went to the prophets and had the prophets preach to the crowd. Are you with me right here? So the angels set you up to preach. They push you and put you in position to reach out to people. Now, it could have been very well interpreted in a worldly sense for Philip right here to say, man, this is, this, the Bible says that this was a, a, a um, official in charge of the treasury of Candace, right? No, it says he was an important official in charge. Isn't that the people we're scared to share with is people that look like they're busy? People that look like they're of high class? Well, according to scripture right here, those are the exact people that need Jesus. And it's up to us to obey the voice telling us to go talk to them. Because very much so, your fellowship of angels, that's your friends when you think you're alone. That's your friends. So for us to give in to sin, we're literally giving in to sin with angels around us. Rethink your thinking right here. So now I'm gonna, now you're walking away. It's a bit more scary. You're going to be way more inspired to share your faith. You're going to be way more inspired to see the results or way more convicted knowing that you're denying the angel's push and the Lord's hand right there. Are you with me right here? So with that in mind, we know that the angels are of salvation. Now check this out. In verse 31, it says, the, the eunuch replied, how can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. You see, the angels push you in the direction towards people that they already know are open. When God's telling you to share with someone, and God's telling you to push with someone, and the Spirit of the Lord's telling you to give your heart to someone, God knows whether they're open or not. God knows whether they're ready to hear the message. God totally knows, and yet it's our worldly view of things that can stop us from sharing our faith. You've got to know that the angels are on your side. Some of us are looking confused, and I've got to paint a picture for you. If you don't know what I'm talking about, if you don't know that compelling feeling, it's because angels aren't encamped around you because you don't fear the Lord. If you don't feel something driving you inside, like James chapter 5 says, the spirit that envies intensely, it's because you don't have the Holy Spirit. And you need to study it out. Every disciple of Jesus Christ knows exactly what I'm talking about. And you may feel convicted, but you need to feel grateful and inspired that you know what I'm talking about right here. That means that angels are rooting for you, that angels are your best friends. They're pushing you to save more people, but you just got to be a disciple of action. Amen? He reads them the passage in Isaiah. In verse 34, you're not going to believe the eunuch's humility. He says, the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? So you guys got to understand how powerful it is that you guys have the first principles. We have it on our phones. You got more scriptures in your back pocket than any other denominational Christian in the world. You have the answers on sometimes your front thigh or your back cheek right there. It may be in your purse. Who knows? But you got it. You may have the pamphlet. You may be that, that one of those disciples that just uses the pamphlet. Like, what's that? Uh, this is a Bible study I'm about to teach you right here. And some of us, we turn the brightness down and we go on our little phones right there and act like we're really leading the study as if we memorized it. But bottom line is that you have the truth. Bottom line is that you have the answers and people are waiting. People have questions. They say, what does the scripture mean? Who's it talking about, himself or someone else? What's the context? And you have the answers, guys. You have the answers. All you got to do is listen to the angel. Listen to the spirit to go teach people that are ready to listen and learn. You're not going to believe this. In verse 35, it says, Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Time out. We got a nugget on our hands. He says, did, did, is this the only scripture in Isaiah that he showed him? Was this the only scripture they looked at? No, this is the one he began with. He began with this very passage of scripture. That means that he began with it, but he didn't end with it. He did a full-on Bible study with this guy right here. He did a Bible study. Guess what? Is the New Testament, New Testament been completed yet? No. So he did a full-on Bible study just with the Old Testament. It says he told him the good news about Jesus. 
from the Old Testament right there. You know, I actually have a study series that I'm going to be giving to you guys in a few weeks. I have the entire first principles laid out of every single study in the first principles in the Old Testament. And we're going to be giving it to the whole church. Seeking God, Old Testament. Word of God, Old Testament. Discipleship, Old Testament. Because you can prove it. So imagine like, imagine some of us, we have missing pages in our Bible. That's okay. The Old Testament is enough. The whole word will do it. But it says you can prove Jesus and teach someone the message. Now, what happens when you teach someone the message? Verse 36, it says, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, the eunuch said, the eunuch brought this up. It was the eunuch's suggestion. He says, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? Hold on a second. He didn't say, why shouldn't I be baptized? He says, why shouldn't I be baptized? He says, why shouldn't I? Why? Because he just heard a bunch of stories about baptism from the Old Testament. You see, you can prove baptism from the Old Testament as well. The Noah's Ark, that was not just a fun boat ride. No, that was about baptism right there, 1 Peter 3.18. Yeah, the Red Sea, yeah, that wasn't just a fun little way to go touch some fish and see some aquariums. No, that was called baptism right there. There's a foreshadowing of baptism in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. Thank God that we believe that as a church this morning, amen? But you're not going to believe this. When you really teach someone the message of God, if it's really the message of God, they're going to feel compelled to be baptized. You want to know why the denomination world can't compel people to be baptized? Because they're not preaching the message of Jesus. When you tell someone the good news about Jesus, they're going to offer themselves up and say, why shouldn't I be baptized? I see all these other results of people being baptized in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, remember, and they said, man, why shouldn't I get baptized? I want to do this too. Notice this, verse 38. He gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. Here's another nugget for you. Check this out. There's Philip in the chariot there's the eunuch in the chariot and then he says he gave orders to stop the chariot who did he give orders to the driver so there's a guy taking notes there's a disciple and there's a non-christian right there it was a full-on starbucks environment are you with me right here and they did a full-on bible study is that not awesome he gave orders to stop the chariot i'm sure he was documenting all of this i'm sure he was great penmanship but check this out it says that in, in, in verse 38, it says, He went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Verse 39, When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. So it has to know, why would it note that they went into the water and that they came up out of the water? If baptism is just sprinkling, why are people going fully in and fully out of the water right here? In John 3, it says there was plenty of water for John to baptize. If baptism is just sprinkling, what's the mention of plenty of water right here? The word baptism means, is baptizo in Greek, means a full submersion in water. Fully immersed. Fully dunked. Romans 6 says when you're fully under the water, Titus 3, Jesus is literally washing you of your sins underwater. It is not a work. It's the work of Jesus Christ. He's under the water washing of your sins, forgiving you, right, sanctifying you, making you a son. By the time you come out, According to the scripture, you're going to be rejoicing right here. And truly, we have one, Jessica, soon to be baptized, who's going to be rejoicing this afternoon. Amen. Now, check this out. People are kind of, people are kind of asking, like, this is, they, they kind of get confused. It says, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. Why did he leave him all of a sudden? Why did he leave him all of a sudden? Because the spirit was calling him somewhere else. You see, when you answer the spirit's call, and it's a good old-fashioned phone call, and you bear fruit, you want to continue to answer the call. But isn't it, isn't it annoying when someone calls you, and you don't want to answer, and then they call you again? And you don't want to answer, and then they call you again. That's what it's like for disciples not listening to angels and the Spirit of the Lord. You want to continue to shut the phone off. You want to continue to not answer the call. But disciples that are fruitful, if you would just realize that you have a fellowship of angels cheering you on, like, come on, Keenan, come on, Brandy, come on, Nick. Come on, Kiara. Come on, guys. I want, to, I want to see you go share with this person. They're waiting for you to explain it to them. If you listen to the spirit within you, you're going to continue to answer the call, and the spirit may call, call you elsewhere. Amen? Amen? But verse 40 says, Philip, however, appeared at Astros and traveled about preaching the gospel in the towns until he reached Assyria. That's exactly what he did. The spirit called him elsewhere. He was so fired up because he made an impact in someone's life, he couldn't wait to go do it again. He couldn't wait because he felt the presence of God pushing him. People are waiting for an emotional reason. People are waiting for a, a baptism, somebody to baptize themselves. People are waiting for the perfect person. All you got to do 
is obey the angels of the Lord pushing you in the right direction. All you got to do is obey the spirit within you. I mean, you guys got to be fired up. You can maybe feel convicted that you've been denying it, but if you know what I'm talking about, you can repent. Isn't that awesome right here? You can make an impact in people's lives. Had this, had, had Philip not obeyed, had he not listened to the angel, had he not listened to the spirit, according to this scripture, many historians believe because the church in Ethiopia immediately started right after this and grew to thousands, they believe that it was this very eunuch who went back to Ethiopia and led the church. Your impact can baptize evangelists. Your impact can baptize the future church leaders. Your impact is the reason that other people will be saved. And your impact is the people reason why they will rejoice. Amen. Turn over here to Matthew chapter 7. So angels of salvation, disciples of action. We're going to read a scripture here. In Matthew chapter 7, and we are looking at a couple basic scriptures that we've all seen before. Of course, these are both scriptures in the Seeking God study. But sometimes you just got to go back to the basics and seek God yourself. But now I think we need to take it as the perspective of mature disciples and seek the angels behind these studies. Seek the angels behind the reason you do these studies. And seek the angels that are behind you in the encampment of fellowship of protection. Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 7, it says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks the door will be opened. A lot of people don't know what to ask for, they don't know what to seek, and they don't know what door to knock on. And I gotta I I, I think it's easier to find the answers if you look at it like this. It says, Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened. So how do you know what to ask for? You got to ask yourself, what do you want to be given? How do you know what to seek? You got to ask yourself, what do I want to find right now? And what door do you knock on? You got to ask her, what door do I want God to open in my life? Whatever you want, whatever door you want opened, you must knock on. Whatever you want to find, you must seek. But whatever you want to be given, you must ask for. These are all action words. The angels are of salvation, but disciples are of action. I think about a time back in Portland, uh, that was about pretty much the peak of my door knocking sales. Okay, I grew up, and every single year from about third grade all the way through middle school, I would do uh, what was called jogathons. You guys remember those right there? You'd knock on there. You want to sponsor me? Ten cents a ten cents a lap. You know what I mean? You do a hundred laps. You know what I mean? That's pretty good. You know, but some people were like, "I'll give you a dollar a lap." Really? You know what I mean? That's forty bucks right there. But anyway, so you do these door knocking things, and who's ever done door knocking sales? Is it hard? Is it is it is it tough? Some people knock on doors for some weird stuff. I mean, like, hi, do you want to buy a powerboat? No. Like, what? Like, that's why I live in an apartment. What do you mean? Like, of course I don't want to buy a powerboat, you know. But people door knock, and it's one of the most scary ways of sales. And for many years, actually, I did that for fundraising. But there came a point where both my dad had lost his business and my mom was unemployed. And this was my way to figure it out. This was my way to make income. So what I started doing, now, who's ever seen a street address painted on a curb? You ever seen that before? That's me. That's me. I would do that. I would paint people's street addresses for them on their curbs. I would do $10 for the colors black and white or $15 for the color of their choice, like one of their favorite sports teams. Okay. Now, all paint costs the same, but that's a little marketing tip right there that, you know, you know, I, I could charge people extra even though they didn't know that. So hopefully no one watching bought my, bought my, you know, <laughs> curbs right there. But a little, little nugget right there. I don't do it anymore. So anyway, it's, it was my business. I can do what I want. Anyway, so... I would do that. Now, I invited my other friends, and they thought it was a genius idea. All my friends thought it was a genius idea. And so they started doing it with me. However, there came a point where, I mean, literally every one of my friends, and there'd be other people doing it to raise money for camp and for other activities and to pay the registration fees for sports. And literally, they would go out, and after four or five houses, they'd say, man, I just don't want to do this anymore. i got to stop. Like, I just, I just can't handle this anymore. I want to go home. And so they'd go home, back to their parents, back to their homes, back to their parents with jobs who were going to pay the registration and pay for their camp anyway. But for me, I had to make a decision. I said, man, like, th there is no walking away. There is no option. I can't go home. This is my only way to pay for school. This is my only way to pay for my new clothes. This is the only way to pay for my camp. This is the only way to pay for my whatever I want. There is no going home. And I said, I had to convince myself that no matter what no I experienced, there is a yes out there. In every neighborhood, there's a yes out there. I said, there's money out there. There's people that will do this. 
And I, go, I went door to door to door, and I started to change it, where I no longer took it personally when people said no. Can I paint your curb? No. Can I paint your curb? No. I said, I said Let me, hold on, before I, before I tell you what I want, just listen to me. I need something from you. I need something. And I had to change my perspective on how I talk to people. And there was about three or four doors that I, I knock, began to knock on. And very many people, they go like this. Oh, they're not home. Got to go. All right, sounds good. Right? And people are, are basically, they're knocking and waiting for no one to be home. And that's how some of us share our faith. We knock, do you want to come to church? And the first sign of no is, okay, sounds good, you're not open. And they immediately leave. But what I started doing is I would knock on these doors. I said, I, I would even say, I, said, I see cars in the driveway, someone's got to be home. No one's in bed, it's 6 o'clock. Because I believe someone's in there. And literally, there was people in there. And, I mean, eventually, they're just like, man, like, oh, he'll go away eventually. Okay, what's going on? Why isn't this guy leaving? Why is there a woodpecker on my door? You know what I mean? And yet people you share your face with are doing the same thing. They'll stop knocking eventually. They'll stop sharing eventually. This is a temporary experience. They don't really want me to come to church. I'll just wait till they leave. And yet people do that. And yet I had three people that I knocked on because you got to use your discernment. I saw cars in the drive. You don't just go knock on random doors and just hang out there. You know what I mean? That's how you get arrested. <laughs> but I saw cars there. I had a reason to believe that someone was in there and that someone needed my product and someone needed this. And it wasn't about what I had to offer them, but I started to share why I needed the money. I said, listen, honestly, I need to sell something. You might not need this. I started knocking on doors that I even already had it done. I said, I'll redo it. I'll do it on the other side of the curb. I'll do it wherever you want. I'll, I started offering stuff to people that I didn't even have the, the tools for. I said, I'll, I'll mow your lawn. I said, I'll clean your toilet. I said, I'll do anything. Here's why. Because I'm in a predicament. My dad's lost his business. My mom's unemployed. I'm trying to go here. I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to pay for school. And you wouldn't believe people started to buy it. I made, I made over $100 in less than an hour when I started changing this perspective. I went all day without making a sale. And I started telling people why I was doing it. And all of a sudden, I started to get sales. And for many of us, it's very, it's very hard. In the same way that we look at this, that this eunuch was the only man in Philip's view. Philip was in the middle of the desert, and it couldn't be more obvious who God wanted him to share with. And for me, I took every house as if there was no one else, and I said, this house has to be the one. And that's how you got to share your faith with people, is you got to look at people and say, God has told me to come to you. The Spirit has told me to come to you. There's something about it here. I'm going to knock on your door until you open up because you got to ask and it will be given. You got to seek and you will find, but you got to knock hard and boldly until the door opens. Amen? Disciples of action. It takes a lot, guys. I knew there was a yes out there. I knew there was a yes out there. And you got to know the same thing that there's yeses out there, there's people that will support you. And I think. For many people, we make sharing our faith about them. They say, you need, you say, you need to come to church. You need to do this and that. you got to start telling them why you're doing it. Listen, I'm sharing my faith with you out of the gratitude of my heart that I've been saved. I've been reconciled. I have a family. And let me tell you where I was. Let me tell you my circumstance. They want to see results. People only follow things today when there's results behind it. Nobody wants to follow some pyramid scheme if there's not results. Nobody wants to follow anything without results. And yet, if you're sharing your results, because everyone here is proof that you can find more people like yourself. Everyone here is proof that there are other people out there like this. This is proof that the world needs to be saved. Is that if you guys have been impacted, your only job is to go find more people that are just like you. That are humble, that are ready, that are ready to listen to the scriptures, that are dying for someone to explain it to them. And all it takes is to listen to the angel of the Lord and the spirit within you. Amen. You know, point number two, we're going to jump over here to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10. Point number one was angels of salvation. Subpoint was disciples of action. Point number two is angels of validation. Angels of validation. My subpoint is disciples of enthusiasm. Angels of validation, subpoint, disciples of enthusiasm. Daniel chapter 10, 
starting in verse 4. It says, On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, and I looked up there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of the finest gold around his waist. His body was like crystallite and facing his face like lightning, his eyes like a flaming torches, and his arms like the legs and the gleam and the burning bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. Okay, this is the angel of God right here. Isn't that amazing? Do you guys want to know more about the angel of God? Yeah. Then come back to part three after my honeymoon, amen? <laughs> and notice it says that there was flames in his eyes. There was torches burning in his eyes. When a disciple's on fire, when you have the spirit, when you're, spirit, when you're filled with the spirit, you're not filled with anything else, are you? When, you got, when you're filled with the spirit, and yet when you're filled with the spirit, your eyes are on fire. You've got to be able to see a fire in a disciple's eyes. You got to be able to see a fire in people. That people have what, what Tim calls theme music. He uses the analogy like you ever seen, like where the TV's mute. You got you sat on the on the remote right there, and the TV's mute, and you see somebody walking down the street. You're like, man, this is boring. What's going on here? But you turn the volume on, and you hear, and it makes it way more interesting. This man's the most interesting man in the world. And yet, with theme music, with a fire in your eyes, when you're filled with the Spirit because you've been listening to the Spirit, it's alive, it's active, it's being used. Are you with me right here? Then you can have the fire. You want to know why you can't baptize someone? It's because maybe you're not on fire. You want to know why you can't impact someone and light them on fire? It's because maybe you're not on fire yourself. We can't be wet wood disciples. You can't light wet wood on fire right here. We can't be wet wood disciples. You can't be a wet wood disciple where you're just sawed down by the world right here, but you're lit on fire because of the angels that are in your life. Amen. In verse 7, in verse 7 he says, I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. The men with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them, and they had fled and hid themselves. Wow. So there's people that see the vision, and there's people that are overwhelmed because they can't see the vision. When you can't see vision, I'll tell you, you'll be stressed out. In verse 8, he says, So I was left alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale, and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking as I listened to him. I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. You ever had one of those sleeps before? You're just like, man, I'm so tired. You know what I mean? And it's just face to the ground, pillow right there. Memory foam, what? You know what I mean? I've had, I've had one of those, but I sleep on the ground, so sometimes I'm like, oh, wait, shoot, I'm right here. I can't fall false face on the ground, but I will get a bed eventually. Amen. I will have a place to lay my head, but even though Jesus didn't. Now, according to the scripture right here, Daniel saw the vision, but it said that he was exhausted. It said that he was tired and he was so helpless and he felt so weak. You see, when you're exhausted as a disciple, you're doing something right. It's because you see the vision. It's exhausting to be a disciple. It's exhausting to know that the great commission falls on you. And yet, if you're not overwhelmed in the church, if you're not overwhelmed in the church, and you're not exhausted in the church, you're not a part of the church. If you're overwhelmed, it's because you can't see the vision, and you're thinking about yourself. And if you're exhausted, it's because you're completely about the mission. If you feel tired today, God is grateful. God understands. He says, good. I was exhausted too, and I was dying for all of your sin." He goes, good, I get it. Every single day, I couldn't even wake up and spend more than an hour with God before I got interrupted in the middle of my quiet time to go help these people. Right. I'm exhausted all the time. Every time he went to go to the city and go pork, he says, guys, let's go get a little bit of rest. More people came to him. They, even the apostles started to get exhausted. Like, man, send these people away to go get their food. He goes, no, why don't you feed them? We're exhausted, Jesus. What the heck? He goes, exactly. That's the only way I'll give you rest. That's the only reason why you earn your rest in heaven, is if you exhaust yourself on this earth. And yet, only disciples can know what I'm talking about. People are like, man, I'm a Christian, but I've never been exhausted or overwhelmed. I got Jesus. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. You don't have the vision. If you don't see the vision, you're overwhelmed. When disciples are not about it, they're overwhelmed. You ever notice when you're super exhausted, you're not overwhelmed? You're actually very relaxed. You're just like, I can't wait to go to sleep. Why you're not overwhelmed? You're, you're like totally relaxed. Like oh, no, I'm ready to go to sleep. I'm ready to go to sleep, man. You know, and, and, but yet when you're overwhelmed, you have a bunch of energy. It feels like this overwhelming energy consumes you, and that's why it's so frustrating. And that's why people fall away. It's because they're so overwhelmed in the church because they don't see the vision. Guys, I'm telling you guys that we're the only church that takes the weight of world evangelism. 
World evangelism is on our shoulders, and it's overwhelming, guys. But only when you do the work will you be exhausted, and it will remove the stress. It will remove the pain. And yet, Daniel was the only one who saw the vision, the only one. The only one that proves that, people, that, that, that God is with the underdog. God is with the few numbers. And yet, we have so many people that claim that there's a different gospel out there. They claim that there is peace among this earth, that you can have heaven on this earth. I was sharing my faith with this lady at Toyota dealership, and she said, you can experience heaven on earth, and you can understand the fullness of Christ, that there's not a worry in this life, that you only, as long as you focus on yourself, you can be saved, and you can have a time with the Lord every single day. You just got to make sure to, to stay away from as many people as possible. That's the ultimate, that's the ultimate, that she said, that's the ultimate way to peace. And I'd say, I agree, that's exactly where the demons run from Jesus. I agree, they, they can't stand it. And yet, it's very easy to numb out in the church. To say, man, I just want to plug my ears. I just want to mute my phone. I don't want to answer things because I don't want to be overwhelmed and I don't want to be exhausted. I just want to be comfortable. And 1 Corinthians 1 says, if you want to see the vision, then if you come here tomorrow morning disturbed, I'm here to comfort you. If you've come here comfortable, I'm here to disturb you. That's the angel's job, is they come here to validate you. And he says in verse 10, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you are highly esteemed. Consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you and stand up for I have now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. Wow, angels of validation. They said, don't worry, we've been listening to your prayers. You're highly esteemed. You're highly favored. You're chosen. Don't worry, we see you. We know you're exhausted. I've seen your work. I'm right there with you. I'm here to help you. And yet he was, he was standing up trembling. You ever felt like that as a disciple? You're so weak. You're so weak, and yet a little bit of validation can get you to stand up. To know that you're validated as a Christian. You're validated in God's eyes. That God validates you every single morning. Lamentations 3 says his mercies are new every morning. He validates you and says, you are mine. You just need to stand up. If you're exhausted, good job. Exhaust yourself in the church. And he says in verse 12, then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. Hold on a second. The angel comes to, to, to Daniel and says, since the first day you set your mind to understand and you humbled yourself, I, I heard you. I've heard you the whole time. Well, why didn't you come immediately? I've heard you the whole time. What's going on? I can imagine Daniel like, why didn't you come to me? Why didn't you answer me? If you heard me the whole time, why are you letting me just cry out here like a maniac right here? Why am I exhausted? Why am I giving so much of my heart and you're not answering my prayers quicker? He goes, I've come in response to them. He goes, let me explain myself, Daniel. I can imagine the frustrated look on Daniel's face like, you heard me the whole time? So the angel has to explain himself. In verse 13, he says, don't worry, Daniel, but the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. So he says, since the first day he set his mind, he's heard him the whole time. That means for 21 days, he was praying for the vision. For 21 days, he was steadfast. Proverbs 4, 7 says, understanding will cost everything you have. He had to give it all he got. He had to pray his heart out to understand. Sometimes understanding is okay. Not understanding is okay. It could be that there's an angel on their way. It says the Persian kingdom resisted him 21 days. But then Michael, one of the chief princes, Michael the archangel, came to help him because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Whoa, 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 whoa. So he's saying, hey, listen, I'm an angel of the Lord. I was sent in response to you. But a demon opposed me and detained me for 21 days, and I was trying to come to you. And you kept praying, and we heard you, because we understand Hebrews 1 says that are not all angels, ministering spirits, sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? So when you pray, angels are sent to serve you and answer your prayers right here. And yet if you wonder why your prayers are not being answered, it's because it's a good one, and it should be answered, and there's a demon that doesn't want it to be answered right there. He's detaining your prayers. The more you pray, more angels will come, undetain those angels, so that you can get the message of God right here. You've got to understand the spiritual warfare that's going on. There are angels and demons all around us. There are angels and demons everywhere. And yet when you pray to God, he sends angels. But when you also pray to God, Satan sends his angels as well. You've got to know that angels are of salvation. Don't think that Satan's angels are any less. They have, they have a lot to do with salvation too. They're the reason why some people don't get baptized. They're the reason why some people fall susceptible to sin and cowardliness. They're the reason why people don't share their faith. There's the reason why sentimentality creeps in. And he says that he was detained by the king of, of Persia. And then Michael was sent to him, freed him up. And then in verse 14, he says, Now I have come to explain to you what will happen 
to your people in the future for the vision concerns a time yet to come. So point number two, angels of validation. They come and t- they validate you. When you get a prayer answered, it's a validation that God's listening. It's a validation that God really wanted you to get that. Isn't that awesome right there? The more you pray, the more you ask, the more you receive, the more you feel validated. So when you pray and you get a prayer answered, it's validating you. But that creates, sub point, disciples of enthusiasm. Enthusiasm means God in us. Doesn't that fire you up when you feel validated? Like if I tell you, you're awesome. You're a Bible talk leader. God has chosen you. God has called you. It can create some enthusiasm. Like, yes, I am. I am that. I am a little bit awesome. Okay, I don't want to be prideful. But I do feel good, right? And yet when you're validated as a disciple, you can be enthusiastic. The only reason why people aren't enthusiastic and they don't sing at church is because they don't feel validated. They don't feel like they should be here. They don't feel like they belong to be here. They don't feel like anyone else wants them to be here. And in fact, they're not even sure if God is proud of them. And yet it's only because you've stopped praying. It's only because you haven't wrestled and exhausted yourself in prayer in order to get the angels to answer you. I promise it's going to be way more validating. Let me tell you something. It'd be very easy to validate that Liz liked me and that Liz loved me one of the first weeks that we ever started meeting. But I've waited three years for a validation right here. I've never even kissed this girl. We've never been intimate before. This is a totally pure relationship. There is no validation, but I'll tell you it's worth waiting for. The longest stretches of exhaustion create the best rest and yet the longer you exhaust yourself the more rest you will find if you're not exhausted you can't have rest heaven's not for you heaven is not for people who want to have a comfortable life on this earth this is a church for people who want to lay down their lives for the gospel right here who want to exhaust themselves because i'll tell you what there's no rest in hell there's no rest in hell you will be exhausted and work as a slave in hell you got to pick your kingdom and you got to pick your comfort. Where do you want to rest? Let's close out in Luke chapter 1. You guys learning about angels here? Luke chapter 1. You know, I think about the validation that we have here in the South region. You know, and it's just such an honor to be here in the South region at this time, to be in the movement at this time, guys, it's, it, it just, it's just mind-blowing, guys. When I think about our Bible talk leaders, it just, it just validates the kingdom. It validates what we're doing. It validates my faith. It validates what we're trying to build here. We're trying to build a great church. It is not great leaders that make great churches. It's great churches that make great leaders. Are you with me right here? And I look at this, and I, and I think about Stacey and Lynette Ibarra. I think about our house church leaders, the Lakewood Bible Talk and the Fruitful Hills Bible Talk. And these are pillars of the faith, guys. These are people who have adopted so many brothers and sisters in the kingdom that people that came in without a mom, that came in without a dad, quickly found it within Stacy and Lynette. And I know I was, I was a, it was a byproduct of that. When I first moved here to LA, it was tough, guys. It was tough. I was living out of my car for the first couple weeks, had a lot of troubles moving into an apartment, and it was rough. And I remember I thought about it, I said, man, I already have everything in my car. I could very easily just jump right back in and drive all the way back home. I thought about that. And I remember I got a phone call from Stacy, and he says, how you doing? I said, I, you ever done that before? You're like, good. <laughs> Not good. You're totally tanking. You're totally struggling your face off, about to fall away. And you're like, good. And he goes, how you really doing? I said, Not good. You know what I mean? He goes, let's get together. We're going to go golf, and I'm going to take you out around, around Long Beach. So we went to go play golf. He took me down to Bixby Knowles and I go golf course. I tanked it up, you know. I went and played, uh, you know, ball chasing, but some people call it golf. You know, I went ball hunting. It was just, it was, it was hard stuff. And, and then he got me an Arnold Palmer, which anybody knows I go to Buffalo Wild Wings. I love Arnold Palmer's right there. Um, and, and then he took me to Goodwill. Oh, that won my heart. And for those of you who know, I've been at Goodwill ever since. Amen. That's where I cop all my gear. I got this at Goodwill, these at Goodwill. God, those are good. You know what I'm saying? But, but Stacy planted the seed. He also watered it, but God made it grow. Amen. Um, and, and I think about that. I think about them. And yet that's who they are for the South region. They can validate you guys. They can be used by God to validate you. If you feel like you shouldn't be here, have a talk with these guys. They've been around a long time. They are heroes and pillars in the faith. Lynette has helped me and Liz so much. Her support. She, they are the most loyal people I know. They, they are so crazy loyal. 
they'll be behind your back. Any trash that gets spoken in the church. Have you ever spoken trash in the church? Yeah, you've been confronted by Stacey and Lynette. Like, well, hold on a second. What'd you say, bro? Bro, we don't say that, bro. You know what I'm saying? Bro, 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 bro. hold on. Hold my rock star. Hold my rock star. What did you say? You know what I'm saying? And that's the Ibarras, is their loyalty. You know, I think about, I think about the Johnsons. I think about Drew and Shamika Johnson. Let's give it up for our other house church leaders. Think about Drew and Shamika Johnson. These guys will tell it straight. These guys are all about the family. You know how protective are they are of their kids? Yeah, you're their kids too. You know what I'm saying? You think about a mama bear and her cubs? No, 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 no. He's papa bear too. He doesn't mess around. If you've ever felt like if there's ever been a time where someone disrespected you, it got handled. There's so many fires that, that Drew and Jamika have put out that you don't even know of. There's so many people that have apologized to you that have been sent to you by Drew and Jamika that they saw a problem and they went and engaged it and fixed it. They are doctors that don't need a phone call. They just handle stuff. And yet I've been handled by them as well. Drew and, Drew and Jamika have sat me down as well. I've had Shamika tell me straight a few times. Like, listen, if you don't do this, if you don't, if you don't stop this, this is going to hurt a lot of people. Drew has sat me down before and in the most respectable way I've ever been discipled. He said, bro, you need to change this, bro. You got to be careful how you say this. And I brought this to me and I was like, man, like that, I, it makes me feel protected. It makes you feel validated. It reminds you that this is the kingdom that we disciple one another, that people care about where you're at spiritually. When you're not being discipled, people have stopped caring. If you've never been discipled, no one cares about you. And you don't really have a family. If you're not being discipled anymore, people have given up on you. People say, man, that's just who you are. You're undiscipleable. It's not fun to disciple you. But when people come into your life and disciple you, it only validates that God's working on you and he wants you to be perfect. And the Johnsons are the ones that come in and they make sure you know, understand that you're validated. They don't let you walk away getting discipled without knowing that you're loved and taken care of and believed in. I've never, felt, I've never been discipled before and felt more believed in and inspired to repent than after I got discipled by Drew Johnson right here. And this guy's a maniac and a warrior for the gospel. Amen. I think about our dear shepherds, Lance and Connie Underhill. Lance and Connie Underhill. I mean, guys, they, they've been in, in all the movements. Moses movement. I mean, no, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. Mainline Church of Christ right here. No, but really, that's how long they've been around. They got so many, they got so many nuggets. That's why they're so wise. It says, he who wants to become wise walks with the wise. Amen. And if you've ever hang, hung out with, with Lance or Connie, they will feed you that wisdom and they will take care of you. Literally, they have the spirit and the work power of 20-year-olds. They fit in. They're, they're going. They're going all day. It says the willing spirit sustains you, right? Are you with me right here? And they follow the commands. There's things that prolong your life and that will keep going. I'm ready to see these people do amazing things. And I, I believe that they're even at a point in their lives where yet they haven't even reached their peak or prime yet. They have so much more to give, so much more to do. And you look at what they've already done and what they've already given. To think about the chairs that you're sitting in, Lance Underhill. To think about the organization of all the food, Lance and Connie Underhill. To think about all of the Shepherd Circle, which is going to be Monday night, that's Lance and Connie Underhill right here. If you think about all they give, I mean, there's been so many times, guys, in my darkest times, God, in my, in my dark, darkest times in the South region, Lance and Connie Underhill pulled me in, sat me down, and as I say, one of the greatest forms of communication is listening. And that's why Lance and Connie Underhill are such great communicators. It's because they're great listeners. If you feel a lot on your heart, if you're not feeling validated, if you're not feeling like a person of action, these are people that are willing to listen to you, and I'll tell you what, they'll make you feel validated, and they'll fill you up with that enthusiasm that you need. There hasn't been one conversation that I've walked out of with Lance and Connie that I didn't yet, yet feel convicted, but I felt taken care of. I felt respected. That's why denominational churches are so, so on fire is because they just open up their doors and they say, listen, come on in. God understands. This and that. God understands. God comforts you. He wants. He has a plan for you. He just opened up. And the reason why people keep coming back is because they never get challenged to change. And yet, the underhills have something so special that they will be willing to listen to you and perfectly give you the direction that you need to repent. You know it's the funnest thing in the world to repent? It's the most refreshing thing. And they are masters at it. They're masters at listening to your problems, helping you to realize how faulty and stupid they are. And then they give you a direction to repent. In Liz and I's darkest time, we were about this close to breaking up, and we were in Lance and Connie's uh, uh, front dining room, and they were listening to me spill a bunch of robot trash out of my mouth, saying, like, I just think that this is going on. I think this is going on. And they looked at me when many people would look at me with no hope. And yet they still looked at me and believed in me. They still looked at me and believed that I could be standing here right, right here someday. 
because of their faith in me, because of their faith and their hope, and because of their validation from God, they're able to validate others. They're able to feed their enthusiasm to others. Connie's constantly going on prayer walks, and it's so exciting. She goes on prayer walks for all the time. She's just like a little, just like a little freight train, just you know, on prayer walks every morning. And yet she spends her time with God and continues to get validated by God and filled with enthusiasm, God in us, so that she can continue to give it to others. Because of their faith, we can stand here validated and full of enthusiasm. Amen. Amen. I'm so grateful for our house church leaders. I'm so grateful for all the Bible talk leaders that we have stepping up. I'm so excited to see what people will do. I'm so excited to see what Levi is going to do. I'm so excited to see what Angel's going to do, what Gus is going to do. I'm so excited to see what Dakota is going to do, what Keenan's going to do, what Yaman's going to do, what all the campus ministry is going to do, and all these other Bible talk leaders, guys, and all of their co-leaders. I'm so excited. And I think that if we can realize, guys, the pillars of faith and the validation that we have saying that God's given us the Underhills, God's given us the Ibarras, God's given us the Johnsons as ceilings for us, as pillars to look up to, as people to run to, that if you're low in your faith, you can go get it validated by people that are above you that are obviously closer to God and that have been doing this a long time, that know what it's like to feel what you feel. Any kind of way you feel, you can go to them and get reassurance and validation. Let's finish out in Luke 1. And right here, we're going to look at the last uh, little story right here of right after John was born. And yet John the Baptist was very similar to Philip. He's very similar to single prophets walking in the desert, not really knowing the plan, feeling like he's the only guy standing. You ever felt like that before where you're just like the only disciple in your workplace? You're the only disciple in your campus. You're the only disciple in your Bible talk. You know what I'm saying? You've ever those moments before. You're like, man, I just feel alone. And yet... God believed so much in John, and I believe it's the very same pillar of faith that we are today. In Luke chapter 1, it's going to pick up, and they're talking to, uh, their prof- there's a, a bit of a scripture here. It's going to explain and help John's parents understand who John, John was as well. And in verse 62, it says, They made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, His name is John. To everyone's astonishment, he, he made his name John. Immediately, his mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed, and he began to speak, praising God. The neighbors were all filled with awe, and throughout the hill country and Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard them wondered about it, asking, What then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. You know, it's interesting, we learned a couple weeks ago in our sermon from here to there, that tablet is the word Peter, and so he's writing on the tablet the name John, which means the gift of God or the grace of God. So he's writing on what we would consider the law and marking it with grace. He's marking grace, covering the law, covering over the law, and it was astonishing that they would choose a, 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 the, word, the name grace right there and to know that you were named with grace. To know that God sees you the same way that people, says right here, people pondered who John was going to be. People pondered who John was going to become. And yet you look at the scripture and they said, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. See, when the Lord's hand is with you, there's no saying what you're going to be. There's no saying where you're going to go. And there's no saying what you're going to become. There's no saying what's going to happen in your life if the Lord's hand is with you. If the Lord's hand is with you, he can move you, mold you, and press down on you however much he wants. But you need to ask yourself, when was the last time you reached out to somebody, you studied the Bible with them, you made them into a disciple, and when they came out of the waters of baptism, you stood there and pondered, what then is this child going to be? What is this guy going to be? What is this girl going to be? When we saw Michael rise out of the waters of baptism, we all stood and looked and said, man, what is that kid going to be? What is he going to do? When we saw Brandy come out of the waters of baptism, we said, man, what is this girl going to do? What is this girl going to be? What is this child of God going to do in this life? When we saw Genesis raise out of the waters of baptism, we said, man, what is this girl going to do? What is this girl going to be? And I just have a question for you. What will be of you? What will be of you? What will be of you today? What will be of you this week? What will be of you this summer? And what will be of you the rest of this year? What will be of the men and women and the brothers and sisters and the sons and daughters of the Salish region of the City of Angels Church? 
we will be the people of impossible fruitfulness. We will be the people about evangelism and personal fruitfulness. You will be the reason others are able to be. You will be the reason others are able to become. And you will be the reason that others will be called child. And they will be the reason you keep going. But they will be no more than a reminder of not who you need to be, not who you need to become, but they will be a reminder of who you already are. You are a child of God, and the Lord's hand is with you. If you take the S from salvation in point number one, the A from action in subpoint number one, the V from validation in point number two, and the E from enthusiasm in subpoint number two, you get saved. The angels have come and are surrounding you to inspire you to save and to remind you that you are saved. To remind you of your purpose in life. Your only purpose in this life was to come and understand and help people find who they're supposed to be, not who they want to be. To realize who you need to become, not just who you want to become. To realize what God's plan is for your life and that no matter who you do, no matter what you do, no matter who you make, that they will understand that the Lord's hand is with you. If you understand that there are angels of salvation, then we can be disciples of action. If you know that there are angels of validation, you know that we can be disciples of enthusiasm. Let us go out into this dark world, a dark world of demons, and let us be the city of angels. Amen. Yeah.